Now today, we're going to take a look at the miter saw, specifically a sliding compound miter saw. Again, these manuals always come with instructions on general safety, and I definitely recommend uh, you read those things. It's going to be a lot more thorough than my little video here. But uh, let me just show you some of the pointers that I know keep me safe every time I turn this tool on. So as with any tool, you should of course have your personal protective equipment on. At the very least, make sure you're protecting your eyes. Okay, so a tool like this, uh, you have to consider some of the things about what you're wearing even. No long sleeves, okay? It's very easy for those sleeves to get caught up in the blade. You're going to have yourself a problem if you do that. Um, the way you approach the tool, the great thing about a miter saw is it doesn't care whether you're left-handed or right-handed, so there's no excuse for doing things like this, okay? Holding a workpiece over here and holding the saw with your right hand, you should never have to do that. Grab the saw with your left hand, even if you're right-handed, and then hold the workpiece with your right hand, and you can go ahead and do your cuts that way. Never cross your arms. Now, another great feature, some saws have them, some don't, is a built-in um, clamp like this. So when you have a workpiece that you need to cut, really the best thing to do, I'd rather not have my hand anywhere near the blade if I can prevent it. Of course, we want to have this imaginary zone that's probably three or four inches around the blade that we don't ever want our digits, our hands, or anything to be near. So if you have a clamp like this, have your workpiece in place, clamp it down, and now this thing is pretty secure. Um, and you can, I usually do support the workpiece, but I'm a lot further away than I would be if I didn't have this clamp in place. And now it's safe to go ahead and make your cut. Now in a case when you're cutting a really long piece, you want to make sure that the workpiece is completely supported. Whatever means you need to do that, whether you have a built-in fence system or, you know, let's say you build yourself a miter saw station, you want to make sure the workpiece is supported so that once you make that cut, it's not going to flop to the floor because that can be very dangerous. So I've got the support. I've got a clamp that I'm going to use here. And let's talk about what we do with the actual uh, tool itself. Okay, sliding compound miter saw. Some people, and I've seen it's, it's a pretty scary thing, they actually start at the beginning of their cut here, start the motor, and as they're cutting, pull it toward them. And that's really dangerous. That's, the, again, kind of like the, the router thing that we explained the other day. Uh, it's the direction that the blade wants to go. So if you start putting your motion in that same direction, you're going to have you know, something that really pushes with a lot of force. So you want to work against the motion of the blade. You want the blade to put all of its pressure into this workpiece so that it pushes it into the fence and down onto the flat, stable work surface. So what I always do is I come all the way out, okay, and I bring it to its full extension point. And then I turn the saw on, wait for it to come to full speed, plunge down, and then push back. And that's the motion I go through. You'll also notice when I finish the cut, I let go of the trigger and I let it stop while it's embedded in this safe housing here. If you uh, actually bring it back up while the blade's still moving, you have a chance of creating a problem. There could be some kickback. You could. The other thing is the quality of your cut goes down when you do that too because those little um, fibers at the end of the workpiece hit the little teeth and you wind up getting you know, a less than great quality cut. So let's go ahead and actually make a quick cut. Now, if you follow that procedure every time, you're almost guaranteed to have a safe cut. Now, let's say you want to use a, a stop block or something to make repetitive cuts. Okay, we're going to cut this one at about 12 inches. My bionic eye tells me that that's about 12 inches. Okay, so you have an option here. A lot of times you have uh, either a stop block on the left or a stop block on the right. And where do you put it? Well, a lot of it depends on where you're going to secure the piece from. So let me show you an example. I have my clamp set up on the left side. What happens if we set up our stop lock over on this side? Now whether you use these built-in stops or you actually literally have a block of wood and a clamp, whatever is you know, the most convenient for you is perfectly fine. But we have the stop on this side. My clamp is over here, so let's go ahead and clamp it down. Now, we've got a situation here, we're clamped on this side, we're going to make a cut, and our stop is on this side. This piece is going to be secure, this one is not. So does anyone see a problem with that? Anybody? 
Nicole. Nicole sees a problem with that. Very good, Nicole. The problem here is the loose piece is now sort of bouncing between the blade and our stop lock. Just like in the table saw, you never want a piece to be loose between your blade and the fence. Same exact thing here. So you go ahead and make this cut very dangerous. Potentially this piece could fly back at you. So how do we, how do we work around that? Well, what I would do is one of two things. You just have to decide which side you want to work from. You can move your clamp so that it's on this side and this piece then becomes secure and your cutoff piece becomes loose. Or like I would do, just leave the clamp where it is and flip this guy over, use this as your stop, adjust it so it's at least close. Now I can add my clamp. My cutoff piece is now free to do what it wants to do. So if it contacts the blade, it actually will just bounce away from the blade safely and it's not gonna kick back. So let's go ahead and make that cut and you can see how it reacts. Very stable, it just sat there. It could bounce all around all at once and it's not gonna fly back at me. Now, while I made that cut, I actually took notice of something that brings up another good point. This little piece of material back here flew back and now this is not a big deal, that's very small. But there are times when, let's say you're just cutting a little piece off and now you've got a quarter inch piece of material that may very well fall back there. Uh, it brings up a very good safety recommendation and that is to add something like a backer board. Okay, this is just a piece of MDF, happens to be veneered uh, with cherry, but it's a cutoff. I just have some double stick tape here and I'm gonna attach this to the back of the factory fence. Now this does a couple things for us. Not only is it a safety issue because what it's gonna do is stop those pieces from having that option to go back there. If they do go back into this little spot here, a lot of times they bounce around for a little while until they hit the blade and then they go boom right out the front. Uh, so it's always a good idea to install this here and that will make sure that any cutoffs stay in the front and fall down instead of hanging out behind the blade. All right, so you install that the first time and you wanna make your first cut to establish your zero clearance. Now with this kerf cut in here, only the blade can fit through that tiny little slot. There's not enough room for the cutoffs to fit through there. And we have the added advantage, just like a zero clearance uh, insert on a table saw, it gives you a cleaner cut. Same thing here, all of the fibers on the back of your workpiece are now completely supported all the way through the cut, which means an absolute clean cut at the back edge, which is great when you're doing finished cuts on your miter saw. Now I would say the most common way to get a kickback incident on a sliding compound miter saw is when people are using it to rough cut boards. Okay, so let's say like this big piece of wangi here is pretty uneven. Okay, actually it's not too bad considering, but a lot of times your rough material, it doesn't sit real steady. So you put this on here, even if you clamp it down, okay, you're in a situation where as you cut through, you release all that pressure, and when everything settles down, these two halves are gonna actually act very differently than the whole piece did on its own. So when those pieces then decide to move, once that pressure is released, you've got a situation where now maybe more wood is being pushed into the blade, and a lot of times what happens, this saw comes right back at you, and, um, a couple things, I mean, usually it's okay. The saw can only go so far, but it scares you. And secondly, it can really knock your saw out of calibration because it jolts the whole thing. So when you're rough cutting uh, lumber like this, a lot of times it, it is tempting to use this tool. I actually prefer to use my jigsaw though. Um, it's a lot safer. I set up some saw horses and I just cut them down to all of my rough lengths are, are cut and organized. And then once I have some nice clean boards to work with that sit nice and level, then I come to this machine and trim them to, uh, to my final lengths at that point. So hopefully that'll serve as just a very quick review of some of the things you need to be concerned about with uh, this particular tool. 
There's a lot of great resources out there. One of my favorite is actually Mark Adams' safety video. He not only covers the miter saw, but he covers just about every power tool in the shop. And it's really comprehensive and covers just about everything you could possibly want to know about safety on those particular tools. And his, uh, his comments and things on the miter saw were pretty insightful. So I, I recommend that as a resource for you. So we'd just like to take a minute to thank everybody for watching all the, uh, the, the videos this week and participating and commenting and uh, all the bloggers and um, the podcasters, the magazine owners and Fine Woodworking for supplying us with some of their videos. Uh, and even our sponsor, Rockler, who uh, was able to supply us with a bunch of great items for the giveaways. It just turned into an amazing week. Yeah, definitely. And what we'd like to say is even though we had safety week this week, we know that every week is safety week. So hopefully what we've done this week has kind of helped you in your shops and given you some experiences and even made you laugh a little bit. And ultimately, <laughs> safety is something that we should incorporate completely into what we do. But we still need reminders. The, yeah. lo the longer we work in the shop, it seems like the more complacent sure. we get. And that's very dangerous. Yeah. So we can all use a refresher course once in a while. So thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for watching. E an email that I got, damn it, I'm rambling. I need a new cameraman. This one's got some serious attitude. Now here's a safety recommendation. Don't put a bunch of crap in your shop. Uh, <laughs> that are sitting there like this. And not every week. Every week? Be on the left side. Mm, little splinter. <laughs>